I sit in this chair where no one can see anyone but me and Swami, and I look at thousands of faces of people who are practicing duality. They think God's over there and I'm over here. It is a misnomer, it is incorrect. You say you're devotees of the Lord, and yet none of you really listen to anything he has to say. He said the same thing since he was 15, 16 years old. You are the formless, I am the formless. You are gods, I am gods. You are prana energy, I am prana energy. If you want a mantra, here it is. I am God, I am God, I am God, I am God. But everybody wants to believe that there is some other being somewhere else, someone to worship sitting in a chair in Puttaparthi or in Islam sitting in some divine place other than where you are. This is a total mistake. You are all divine beings. And yet, it's so funny, there was a great Maharani. Swami loved her. And I was present with her daughter, and she was telling me just recently a story about her mother and such a Sai Baba, in which they got into a tremendous fight. He adored her because, because she treated him like an equal, like a brother not practicing any kind of duality, and she was tougher than him, because he's very sentimental and he's very sweet, and she was winning the fight. And finally, out of desperation, Swami said, are you scared of me? She said, no, I'm not scared of you, but I'm scared of your Maya. I'm scared of your Maya. So every day, I sit and I watch everyone practicing duality, everyone looking for a glance, everyone looking for their letter to be taken, everyone looking for him to come nearby, everyone practicing the very thing that we, were, we fell from the garden from 25,000 years ago. Because the mind-body experience became overstimulated and suddenly we believe that God was over there and we're over here. You are all divine beings. He has said this from the very beginning, every speech, every time, everything he speaks of. And yet, his maya is frightening. His maya almost demands that you fall into this quagmire of trying to understand whether you are God or not. It's part of the game. It's part of the play. In the early days, at the very beginning, the Rishis were allowed to see the cosmic form. And they realized that it was beyond human consumption, that it could not be seen. One man, in a book called the Brahavad Gita, demanded of his master, Krishna, you owe me a boon. I've done so much. I've done all these things you've told me. I want to see the cosmic body. No, it's not for you. You don't understand. It's not for humans to see. You cannot see the cosmic body. It's beyond human contemplation. It's not meant for human beings. But you owe me all these boons. You owe me a boon. I want it. I want it. I want it over and over again. So, to teach us all, Krishna showed Arjuna the cosmic body. Seconds later, he went, Take it away! I can't stand it! Take it away! It's not for me! Because it's not for you. None of you, nor I, nor anyone that exists understands Sri Satya Sai Baba, Rama, Muhammad, Jesus Christ, realized beings, beings who have merged with their true personality, which is divinity, which is the cosmos. I thought of all the great masters who have been on this planet through the various yugas. You see, we don't have any comprehension of anything but ourselves. 
We don't look at history. We don't really know God. We follow masters because it makes us feel good. Because it's our natural destiny to realize or be on a path, each of us, on a separate path to the same place, which is unity with your true personality. Prana energy. Prana energy is now in everything. It's everywhere. It's the air between us. God is the electron in every atom. Those are his eyes and his ears. The entire cosmos is his body. He can visit any part of his body anytime he wishes. To move towards him is what he expects. It is your good fate, your good fortune, as it is to a Muslim to approach Muhammad. It is to a Christian to approach Jesus Christ. A Zoroastrian to follow Zarathustra a Buddhist to follow Buddha. These great masters have come at the appropriate time when God needed to be on this planet to do only one thing, vibrate his energy, to change the destiny of the planet. When the planet was off course, when the plan wasn't quite correct, they come just to vibrate, not to have devotees and Balvika groups and Psi groups and all these different things. It's secondary. They come as a blessing when the larger plan is not correct. Sai Baba is part of a triple incarnation. This is something called the Kali Yuga. There have been three yugas before this. This yuga, known as the Kali Yuga, is supposed to be the darkest time that man has ever been in, right now. Because of communication, because of the internet, because of this wild material world we've created, we are totally subjected to this powerful, powerful mantra, which is part of the Maya of the world. Fame, Sex, power, money. Fame, sex, power, money. It's on our TV, our radios, the magazines that we read. It has absolutely consumed us and all we do is talk about what we see on TV and what we read and what we think. It is the darkest hour before the dawn. Twenty years ago, a young man who I've known since I was seven years old named Albert Gore, who became Vice President of the United States, but was my next door neighbor. I believed in him. He was an amateur scientist and a very fine, sweet man. In fact, every time I meet his name is Cy Bobby, he goes, good company. So he became a senator and senators can get a tremendous amount of money. The congressmen have more trouble. He wanted to do a study with all these amateur scientists like himself about this biosphere situation. This is 20 years ago. And he called me up to the Senate office building 20 years ago after years of scientific study with various people he'd been in contact with around the world. And he showed me a little slideshow for three hours because he had access to NASA and all the computers the government could give him and so forth. He said, I can believe what's happening. The biosphere is collapsing. He said, because of the population on the planet, industrial farming has become a massive industry and we dump trillions of tons of poisons on the earth every day to get good yields because that's good business. But we're poisoning the underground water system and by about 20, 20 the entire underground water system is going to be soiled where we can't even grow plants anymore and we're going to have a food crisis. He said also there is something called ozone and these chemicals that's in air conditioners and aerosol cans and all this and they're magnetically charged and they're pulled to the by magnetism to the north and south pole and they're cutting a hole through something called the ozone and this allows ultraviolet light to come in, the polar caps are going to melt. It 
and the seas will rise. Every city uh, that's on the coast will be uninhabitable. And because they're all built on landfills, there'll be massive pandemics. And the economic systems, because they're all on coastal cities, which they've always been, New York, London, and so forth, uh, they'll be destroyed. He said also we have something called global warming, which means that everything that is made, this wonderful desk, this piece of plastic, uh, everything that you see in front of you is made with electricity. And that means we have to burn coal and oil to make these things, but it's causing a greenhouse effect and it's making the seas rise 2% centigrade. Once it goes 2% centigrade, then the entire weather patterns, which are totally guided by the temperature of the oceans will change and the growing seasons all over this planet will change to the point where we cannot feed the people. He said, we've poisoned the air, causing all kinds of carcinogenics and all kinds of diseases and all kinds of things will happen and the biosphere is collapsing.